Hi, welcome to High Growth with HTDC. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki. This is where we talk about all things innovation, tech, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing. And there's tons of awesome things going on in the state of Hawaii. And one of them is, my first guest today is Dr. Brett Opegaard. He is with UH's School of Communication. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so you recently launched an app that lets people know when Old Faithful is going to erupt. Is that basically what it is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does. It um, informs people about when Old Faithful and the other predictable geysers will erupt. Predictable, predictable geysers in the upper geyser basin mm -hmm. of Yellowstone National Park. So there are more than 300 geysers in Yellowstone National Park, but there are only a few predictable ones. Six, Six. to be exact. Yes. So these, <laughs> these ones are the ones that the app um, shares the predictions on and then it also gives you direct access to the webcam so you can watch those uh, eruptions happen in real wherever, time wherever you are wherever you are at the site or away from the site That's some cool. people at the site you know they may be at a different geyser and they want to watch uh, Old Faithful erupt but um, at other times you know you're sitting in your house in Honolulu and you want to mm -hmm. um, watch Old Faithful you can do that too does it like, will it send me a text so I can go run over? It does, it has like an alert system. Driver? Yeah? Yes. Oh. So um, it'll alert you 10 minutes before the eruption window begins. So okay. the window is the period of time in which the geyser is likely to erupt. How big is that window? Uh, it depends on the geyser. <laughs> yeah? So yeah. Old Faithful? Uh, old Faithful is a, um, I think it's a 15 minute window. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah so you can it's turn better it better than the cable guy, right? <laughs> that's like three hours. Yeah, that's right. No, it's not that big a window. So Old Faithful that's erupts on, about every 90 minutes. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. That's why people like it. It's a, it's a um, yeah. uh, attraction people can so easily get So you can see it multiple times. Right. Wow. And how do, they, how do they predict the geyser? They predict it by the height of the previous eruption and the length of the previous eruption. And then through tracking this over the years, they've determined that um, if it's a certain height and a mm -hmm. certain length, it's likely to erupt, you know, say 90 minutes later or 87 minutes later or wow. 83 minutes later or whatever it is, depending on the variables. So, the so there's, a, there's a mathematical formula they use for that. So they've always had this information. Yes. <laughs> but now you've given them a way to let everybody else know. Right. At Old, at Old Faithful um, and the Visitor Center there, there are numerous analog um, clocks and whiteboards and sandwich boards wow, that's that what they, they used use to tell people when the um, next eruption will be. And so, so you got to go see the Visitor Center. <laughs> yeah, you have wow. to sit in the Visitor Center or, um, or you ask a ranger. So if you're down there at the site, mm -hmm, the most mm -hmm. common question everybody's walking around asking is, when is Old Faithful going to erupt again? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the way the people at the site have managed that is putting up um, all these different signs. signs and, you know. And then uh, the ranger will come and erase yeah, the whiteboard. Yeah, the ranger will come. And, and there's <laughs> some of these are actually clocks that they hand wind. Wow. And, um, huh. uh, you know, they have various ways to show it down there. But we thought uh, a, a great way to um, manage that would be to put the information directly into the app and remove some of the tr detritus of the um, site, like some of these pieces of paper and mm -hmm. signs, and mm. kind of clean it up a little bit. Wow, that's great! How did yeah. you how did you come up with this idea? This was an idea that um, Yellowstone approached us uh, with. Yeah. So I'd, been working on National, Pro National Park Service projects for a while, and they uh, thought it, this would be good for our research team. Oh. So we had worked on the uh, Fort Vancouver Mobile Project, which was a National Historic Site, mm -hmm. um, and we, were the, we created the first interpretive mobile app in the National Park Service system. So interpretive as opposed to uh, expositional type content that you know, fact sharing and things like that. Interpretive in the sense that we're storytelling in it. And we're using the mobile technology and the affordances of the mobile technology to have interactions with the user at the site and let them participate in the history. Wow. Yeah, so they, um, you know, learn That's a little great. bit, uh, 
respond to what they're learning about and then their um, their participation through the app becomes part of the history of the site as well. Wow. So if they're taking pictures and you can imagine uh, 20 or 30 years from now that mm -hmm. will be historic. Oh, interesting. Uh, those will be historic objects too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So we spent um, several years developing that at Fort Vancouver. That project won uh, several awards and uh, nationally and um, that's great. the National Park Service asked us to do some more work for them after that. Oh, congratulations. And Yellowstone was one of the projects. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so cool. So, as far as communication goes, like, is this part research for you? Yeah, this is absolutely part of my research agenda and part of um, being a, a public servant. What is the goal? Like, what is the research goal? The research goal is to uh, determine how we can better use mobile technologies to improve our lives in uh, whatever ways we can, including mm -hmm. uh, learning, about our history, learning about nature, learning about science, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, interacting with, with each other in more efficient, effective ways. Uh, also, hmm. you know, participating more and being more engaged in our public resources like Yellowstone. So, is there a social part of this app, the Yellowstone, the Geyser app? Uh, this particular phase. We don't, the only social part is the social media feeds that are directed through it. But later phases that we planned will have interactive uh, components. So people will be able to take pictures at Old Faithful, for example, as part of some kind of activity and then share those pictures in some kind of meaningful way, huh. depending on the program. Huh. That's just one example, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Have you seen? Any social activities like with your app? Like, do people share a lot with the uh, historic places? Or yeah, absolutely. This is. Um, I think people have been itching to participate in history huh. and to not feel like uh, you know somebody's lecturing to them about mm -hmm. history. They want to be a part of it and have their own interpretation of it and make the history their own because everybody comes to a, a story from their own perspective. Mm -hmm. And there's no one-size-fits-all in that um, interpretation. So what the mobile technologies allow are for people to um, interpret what they're getting, but and then also sharing that with others allows other people to respond to their interpretations. Hmm. And so it just opens up the conversation dramatically for people uh, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. you know, learn and discuss things that they wouldn't normally be able to do. Especially for kids, are, are schools starting to use these? Because I mean, it sounds like you can get involved with history remotely. Like you don't even have to be at the historic site. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, we're we built a um, tablet app for middle school history classes. Yeah. And in that one, um, the activities are set up for students around the country to work on similar activities and then share with each other between classrooms what they're doing. That's cool. So, for example, we had a an activity about sea biscuits, which is the hard tack that sailors ate. And through the mobile technology, we gave the students a recipe of how to make it, and we yeah. created a video, show, a, a reenactment type video showing historic characters mm -hmm. making it and talking about how they made it. And then um, as part of that re, re uh, as, as part of that uh, reenactment, the characters talked about the way they would dress up their sea tack with uh, or sea biscuits with mm. um, jelly or bacon grease or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the activity is how can you take this very bland, uh, basically flat piece of flour and make it tasty. And so then the kids so the would kids do kids the... could make it and then put on oh. put it on it what they want and then share those recipes oh, and cool. you know the food photos that everybody likes to take. And, <laughs> <laughs> they can do their own home <laughs> cooking shows, like, you know, video record ah, themselves. And then share it with other kids. And then share it with other kids. Mm -hmm. That is cool. So that's one example. The app is full of activities like that. Wow. And um, that's a key part of mobile technology. I think it it opens up those channels between people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. in the past you just had the mass media channels mm -hmm. where it was yeah, a one-way one way. discussion, and now they're mm -hmm. two-way. Yeah. 
or even more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. especially if it's like interactive with the classrooms and the historic sites. That's right. amazing. And it interacts with people at the site and off the site. So uh, mm. our next phase at Yellowstone, we plan to create some activities where people off site will be um, directly interacting with people at in, in Wyoming at, at Yellowstone and um, collaborating on different wow, tasks. That's amazing. Yeah, it could be very fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think we had some screenshots of the app. Do we have those that we could show? <laughs> How many apps have you built so far? Uh, well, it depends on what that, that question means. <laughs> I mean, if you think of each app as an iteration and each time you release it, is a full process of creating mm, an app. Like a whole new uh, one. Yeah, it's like a whole new one. For example, on the Fort Vancouver project, when we started developing it, um, the mobile technologies would only work with native languages. Mm -hmm. So mm. we had to write the app in Java and then Objective-C to Java for Android and then Objective-C for uh, the Apple products. Uh, so as like things change, you could, you know, we were able to um, use an open source program called PhoneGap to um, incorporate the JavaScript and you know huh. HTML5 and that sort of thing, and, and really only write the app once and then yes. alter it a little bit. Uh, so that changed, but um, there are the main projects we're working on right now are the Fort Vancouver mobile oh, app. So that's continuing. Grand Emporium of the West, which is the tablet app for the history classes. Mm -hmm. We have a Blackfeet Nation app in Montana. Wow. At the Black, you know, the Blackfeet Nation there. It's mm -hmm. uh, a journalistic storytelling app. And we have this Yellowstone app. Those are the four primary ones we're working on right now. Wow. And it's so cool. But the Fort Vancouver been. mobile app, you know, there's probably been hundreds of versions of it. <laughs> <laughs> As any app developer would know. Wow, that's cool that you can be here and working on all of those. Yeah. And none of them are here. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we do hope to uh, work on projects here. Yes. We're actually, uh, I should should add, we're, we're working on another project with the National Park Service mm -hmm. to increase accessibility uh, for blind and low vision people uh, through audio description. Mm. And um, we're going to tra basically translate the brochures that are ubiquitous at every park, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Unigrid brochures, into audio formats so it can be shared with... Uh, they don't even have that yet? Uh, no, they don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, not transcription, translation. So there's a difference. Okay. So we're not... Cause you, those brochures are primarily visually oriented. Oh, So I you have to have a huh. cross-modal translation from like a photograph yeah, to yeah, 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 an yeah. audio format. Interesting. Which is... Um, Know, very complicated. And would that be for all the parks? Uh, we, well, we, we're going to start with Starting. some prototypes and then uh, we're going to build a system that should allow all parks who want to do that to do that. Wow. Mm -hmm. huh. And one of the parks we're going to work with is going to be a local park in Hawaii. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Which one? Can you say? Uh, I can't say yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. Good. That's yeah. what I was going to ask. Okay. All right. We're going to take a quick break. My guest today is Dr. Brett Opegaard, UH School of Communications. This is High Growth with HTDC, and I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, on Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having this year. It is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all ages event. Kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between, everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it, some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. Hi, welcome back. This is High Growth with HTDC. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, and I wanted to let you know what's going on around town. There's lots going on. This Wednesday and the other Wednesdays in February, John LeBlanc, 
our local WordPress wizard, will be teaching, teaching you how to build an awesome, content-rich, functional website on the WordPress platform. Classes will be at the Mano Innovation Center and will be increasing in depth and content so that at the end of all four classes, you'll have this amazing website. For more information, please visit htdc.org. Starting February 24th, the Patsy Mink Center for Business and Leadership will kick off their 16 series workshop called Launch My Business to teach you the information and skills you need to know to build your own business, including the chance to learn from other people's mistakes, which is the best way to learn them. <laughs> February 24th also is the Hawaii Information and Communication Technology Association ICT Conference covering 2015 technology trends at the Halekoa Hotel as well as Wet Wear Wednesday. We're going to be joining them in their Pauhana after this conference. So to all our Wet Wear Wednesdayers, please note the 24th is actually a Tuesday. So it's going to be a Wet Wear Tuesday. And we're going to be starting at 5 p.m. instead of our usual 6 p.m. because they have a good happy hour. <laughs> but hope to see you there. Also this month, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association is having their annual award ceremony Thursday, February 28th at the Wailai Country Club. Actually, I think it's the 26th, sorry. February 26th at the Wailai Country Club to recognize the accomplishments of Hawaii's best entrepreneurs. Nominations are still open till this Friday at hvca.org. If you need some quick small business legal advice, every other Wednesday, HTDC offers free legal guidance in partnership with the Business Law Corps. You can sign up for a 30-minute appointment at the Manoa Innovation Center. That's a free 30 minutes with a lawyer. Please visit htdc.org slash legal to sign up. Lastly, calling all SBIR phase one, phase one winners. HTDC offers the state's matching fund for up to 50% of your phase one award. So if that's you and you've won a phase one recently, please contact us at sbir at htdc.org. All right, and now back to our guest. Our guest today is Dr. Brett Opegaard, UH School of Communications professor. And we're kind of, we're talking about some of the apps you've built. Sounds like a bunch. And I was talking about how great it was that you can work remotely on these apps that are mostly on the mainland, I guess. So how, far. Yeah, how does that work, working remotely? Ah, it's one of the great advantages of digital <laughs> media. How do you do most of your work? Are you... Uh, well, I mean, you can you know, conference call, Skype, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I work, I've mm -hmm. worked with more than, uh, on the Fort Vancouver project, we had more than 100 collaborators all across wow. the country. Uh, this Yellowstone project, um, the next phase will include people from, you know, the East Coast to Singapore, uh, Texas, all over. So there's really no way to physically wow. be in the same place That's with all great. these people. Mm -hmm. And the um, digital media allows you to collaborate mm -hmm. in, in various ways, you know, through, uh, you know, documents that you can share. So it's like a whole other video conferencing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Do you bring your classroom into this too? I definitely uh, incorporate the class work as much as I can. And we've had some really fantastic projects come out of uh, students' work. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, um, one of the most interesting pieces that uh, we've done was related to the Fort Vancouver project, mm -hmm. uh, where a student, an undergraduate student, um, had been researching a particular historical story for, for basically his whole life. Wow. And it started out when he was a child, and his father um, was diagnosed with a, with a terrible um, illness mm -hmm. that basically kind of sapped his life away from him over many many years wow. and one of the things these uh, the student did with his father was research this particular historical figure so they drove all around the country and wow, that's did great. all these things but mm -hmm. um, after his dad died the, all mm. the um, research ended up in a box you know in a storage mm. unit and it was never really used Hmm. So when the student ended up in my class, um, so we started talking about it, and, and uh, we decided we should try to incorporate that into the app. Yeah. And this was uh, a story about Moses um, Williams was the first uh, Medal of Honor winner who was African American, and um, hmm. so the student was able to take all these documents out That's and great. kind of get closure to that story. 
produce it yeah. um, as an interpretation of his journey, mm -hmm. you know, with his mm -hmm. dad. So we got a chance to talk about um, on camera what wow. he went through, and yeah, it was really fascinating. And there's yeah. and that story could have been very antiseptic and um, detached, mm -hmm. but it was it became very personal with his telling of it. Yeah, and so that's something that anybody can see with the app. That one is uh, still in in post production, but we just finished it up uh, a few months ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. So is that something like if, if I had that app, mm -hmm. I could listen to that story? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. As soon as it's uh, put in there. That's amazing. Yeah, we've had several examples. I had another student um, working on a, on a story, um, and he was really engaged with it. So engaged, in fact, that he spent his entire summer working on it. You know, after the class ended, <laughs> wow. he had he and his um, group in the class mm -hmm. had just had come up with a great plan and they thought this was going to be a wonderful mm -hmm, mobile mm -hmm. piece to build wow. um, but you know the semester is very short so mm -hmm. he you know said I'm gonna work all summer and oh my God. and he did and he, he got it in um, put together and animate he actually animated it Wow! Yeah, so that's a um, module people can see on Fort Vancouver mobile right now it's called the Paul Kane um, Paul Kane's Wanderings. It's about a Canadian huh. artist who came through the, the Northwest and uh, sketched and wrote about what he saw. And so we took those um, those pieces, those drawings like and those journal yeah, entries yeah, 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 and yeah. embedded them in a particular location where he actually did the drawing huh. 100, 150 years ago. And so when people walk to that spot, the GPS recognizes where they're at and then triggers the phone to shake and, and then delivers the, um, the portrait Content. to the person at that spot. Huh. So you can actually kind of stand in the footsteps of the artist. Wow, that is neat. So the Fort Vancouver mobile app covers all kinds of history in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was the, the very first story was actually a Hawaiian story. About really? The, uh, yes, the uh, Hawaiian, um, immigration to the Northwest uh, through the British Hudson's Bay Company. Oh, yeah. And it is about a um, pastor who yeah. was hired by the Hudson's Bay Company to come and um, settle down the Hawaiians who were too rambunctious for the British at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but surprisingly, when the, uh, when the pastor got there, yeah. the Hawaiians said, you want me to do what on my one day off a week? <laughs> I'd rather go horseback riding and fishing. I don't want to sit in a you know a makeshift church and oh. read this book you gave me. So it was a <laughs> real source of tension. So he became a he was a native Hawaiian, but he became a uh, interesting. He became a person kind of in between two worlds. Yeah. He was very loyal to the British, but um, huh. the so pastor. The pastor. Interesting. Yeah, but he. Um, you know, it's kind of isolated from the Hawaiians and the British. Yeah. The British didn't treat him really as an equal, and either, and the Hawaiians treated wow. him as an outsider. So this is his story. This is his story. Oh, that's and then really the, uh, the the way the story ends is um, this is spoiler alert, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, United States kicked the British out, and <laughs> they um, kicked out all British subjects, including this <gasps> pastor. So yeah. after he had lived there for a couple of decades, they came and burned his house down and oh kicked him out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was a really um, tragic story, very yeah. tragic. But the app, um, you know, mm. puts the story back in its place. It had been a forgotten story. Mm. The, um, the place where the story happened was just kind of an open field. Wow. And we used the GPS coordinates to place those pieces yeah, yeah, yeah. back where they happened. Huh. And we did some reconstruction videos uh, with people in period costumes and wow, that sort of thing. I could see how you could get kind of wrapped up in recreating those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it brings the, the history to life. Yeah, you know, you can read about it in text, and um, it just doesn't quite do it mm -hmm. justice. Education is going to be so different. I mean, it already <laughs> is, right? right? But it's mm -hmm. just sounds so much more fun. <laughs> I hope so. It should be fun because yeah. the way people learn is when they're engaged and exactly. motivated. 
they're not engaged or motivated, it doesn't matter how well you try to teach them, they won't mm -hmm. learn. And it sounds, especially with this kind of interactive apps and learning tools, that it's much more engaging, especially with, right. yeah. And they can participate. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mm -hmm. Blackfeet Nation's another one that's really an interesting story. Uh, that app is based on the worst uh, natural disaster in Montana history. There was a flood in Montana wow. that wiped out um, basically a whole community of Blackfeet along the, the, uh, mm. the river. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the mainstream media coverage was primarily about the property loss, not about the people who died. And, wow. And so this has been a really um, kind of a, what would I call this? kind of a festering story yeah, for the Blackfeet. Like they felt like they, yeah, very sore point, and they've never really mm -hmm. had a chance to have their say and tell their mm -hmm. version of it. Mm -hmm. And so in, in our, our Blackfeet app, we, um, which includes a couple of Blackfeet tribal members as part of our research team, mm -hmm. uh, we documented their stories, put wow, them back in their place, to and then uh, also allow people to respond to those stories. Mm. That's so they great. can, uh, yeah, build out more discourse on it. Wow. How do we find your apps? What do we, are they all? Uh, well, you can search on the different markets. They're uh -huh. both Android and Apple. Great. Uh, NPS Geysers is the Yellowstone one. Geysers. Uh -huh. Port Vancouver Mobile. Blackfeet 64 Flood. Blackfeet 64 Flood. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Blackfeet and uh, Grand Emporium of the West. Ah, Those are the ones to cool. search for. Those are the search terms. Okay. Or you can go to fortvancouvermobile.net and uh, all the links are there. Fortvancouvermobile.net. Yes. If you want to find all those, great. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. That's so cool. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It's going to be so different. I'm so jealous of kids <laughs> these days, I tell you. Thank you so much for being with us here today. This is High Growth with HTDC. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, and my guest today has been Dr. Brett Opazard, UH Communications Professor, and we are on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim. You've been here today, you've seen this, you've heard what she said, what do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from ThinkTech's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Wow. Okay. 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 Sorry. Oh, am I on? <laughs> Hi. Welcome to High Growth with HTDC. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki. Sorry about that. Um, this is where you find out all about innovation, entrepreneurship, engineering, not engineering, innovation, <laughs> and manufacturing. And there's so many awesome things going on in Hawaii that this is a place we'd like to share them with you. And my guest today is 
Andrew Whitesell. Yep. Of Beaumont Design. Are you the founder of Beaumont Design? I am. Great. Very good. And also the MIC tenant. Yes. So thanks for being here. Um, briefly, what is Beaumont? Uh, it's an engineering firm, consulting firm, so we develop products for other companies, or at least help them develop their products. How did you come up with Beaumont? Uh, it's my <laughs> family, it's my middle name. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> Very cool. And how did it start? How did you... Uh, I was working in Silicon Valley for a few years and decided I could work on my own, so I started my own company. and kind of migrated from what I had intended to do, which was develop a certain type of equipment for manufacturing hard drive disks, and ended up getting sucked into all kinds of different products. <laughs> so it's actually really interesting, because I did uh, semiconductors, flat panel displays. Wow, uh, all... this was in when you were in the Valley? Yeah, in yeah, Valley. yeah. And uh, a few years back, well, uh, 10, 12 years back, my father was ill, so I moved back to Hawaii to help take care of him and started working for a company here, did that for a few years, and then went back to doing the consulting gigs. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So you're originally from here? Yeah, born and raised. Okay, cool. Very good. Um, so tell me what specifically your company does. Like, you have several product development. Yeah, we, we do areas. a lot of different things. Um, in the past, it's been uh, capital equipment, medical devices, medical test equipment. The main project that we're focused on right now is, which is really interesting, is the, um, it's a, it's a suite of technologies called the Fecal Sludge Omni Ingester. Sounds yummy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're developing, I, I'm managing the project and also internally developing technology for the project. Uh, so there's over a dozen companies that have been involved in the project over the last few years. Wow. Uh, but we're developing sanitation equipment for the developing world. Should we show the pictures? Sure. Would that be sure. helpful? So yeah. we have some pictures to kind of help talk about the Where do I see fecal, that? what is it? Fecal <laughs> sludge omni ingester. We just okay. call it the OI. So this is a community in Nairobi called Kibera. It's, a, it's the largest slum in Africa. And depending on whose figures you believe, there's three mil 300,000 to a million people living there. And it's about the size of Waikiki. So wow. two square kilometers. And the they, whole thing looks like that? It pretty much all looks like that. Um, there's very sense. little power. Uh, there's, no, there's no sewer system mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So everybody uses uh, latrine pits. Wow. And so there's, they're either manually, em well, they're almost entirely manually emptied. I'll show you some pictures of that. This is another community in South Africa. You can see the difference. This is a hillside, mm. uh, lots of vegetation. Um, so the, the conditions that we need to develop the equipment for vary quite a bit. Harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, the next couple slides are pictures of school bathrooms. Ooh. So that's, that's a typical, actually this is a pretty decent school bathroom. Yeah. Uh, no doors, no toilet paper, no toilet seat. Wow. Um, and it just goes into a pit that needs to be emptied out. This is another school bathroom. Uh, and this, that's the bathroom? That's the bathroom. Oh. That's the toilet right oh, there. Oh, um, The kids actually don't want to use this bathroom. So if you look at the next slide. Yeah, I would not want to use that bathroom. The kids actually go around back <gasps> and oh, use no. the bathroom outdoors. Boys, girls, doesn't matter. And wow. that's one of the reasons that girls tend to drop out of school after a certain age. They don't because, want to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. That's so crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that it? No. Uh, oh. there's, a, there's a bunch more. OK, so there's two ways that you, you actually uh, extract the waste out of latrine pits and septic tanks. So this is just like we do it in the US, vacuum truck, except mm -hmm. these, these vacuum trucks are probably 35 years old on average, and they're, they're not very effective. Mm. And they can't pump very far, so, oh, so they, they can. actually can't access the pits in the slums. Either they can't pump far enough or the, the roads just don't exist, so they can't drive to the pits. Um, and in any case, the next slide shows what they do with it, which is they oh. just drive into a field and dump it. Wow. And this is actually farmland, so oh. all the waste just goes right onto the crops. Um, and oh so you get disease spread that yeah. way. The alternative is manual emptying. So this is a, a 
outdoor latrine pit mm -hmm. with a squat plate. And then the worker will come along and pick that squat plate up. Mm -hmm. And you get to see what's inside. And they dig all that so out. So they have to dig this out manually. Wow. So I have a good story with this one. Um, yeah. When they, there was, a, there was a group of us here, and yeah. when they lifted up that squat plate, I would have to guess 200, 300 cockroaches <gasps> yeah. came pouring out. And being from Hawaii, was, I, I kind of stood there and watched them run across my feet. Like the huge ones? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one of the crew, who was a, a photographer, yeah. who had shot uh, uh, war photography, mm. she just took off running down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny that she was actually yeah, afraid. Yeah. Um, oh and this is what they do at the waist. If you back up, they actually dig a receiving pit next to the latrine pit. And, and they just, just put it there. Just dump it there because they want to reuse the, the deep latrine pit mm -hmm. because it's already got a wall around uh -huh, it and a squat uh -huh. plate. So, but they don't have a place to take the waste, so they just dump it wow. on the ground near the house. Oh. This is another, this is a bathroom. Um, wow. So it's being manually emptied, and the next slide shows them. So they take it, they put it in the bigger bucket, and then they carry the bigger bucket. And the next oh, slide. To the side of the house. No, in this case, it's a little better or a little worse, depending on uh, your what you believe. Uh, next slide shows it gets loaded into this 50-gallon drum. On wheels. And then they take that down. The next slide shows they take it down to the river and they dump it into the river. Oh, so oh my gosh. That's the Nairobi River. Wow. And that's all trash on the side. And, you know, there's huh. probably hundreds of these guys dumping waste every day right into the river where the kids are playing and oh. people are doing their laundry and all of that. Uh, wow. Take so, so much for granted. Yeah. This, the next slides show a bunch of the technology that's being developed. Uh, this is a pilot plant that's being developed by one of the companies and working on the project. Uh, we can just run through the next few. This Pretty quickly. Is, uh, okay. Yeah, this is a test lab. So we actually don't work with human waste all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's too much of a burden and it's, it smells bad. Yeah, and it's yeah, yeah, expensive yeah. actually and there's all sorts of problems associated with it. So we, we develop simulants mm -hmm. that we that can, so we can mimic kind of different characteristics and... of the human huh. waste. Yeah. Um, this is one of the pumping systems that was developed. Wow, it's on a pickup truck. Yeah, yeah, it's actually pretty small. Yeah. Uh, That's amazing. And this is a prototype of one. They're actually all prototypes, but this is an early prototype, and then the next shot shows the sort of the final version of it. Where is this? Where, where are these prototypes? This one is in Seattle. Uh, okay. One of the developers is in Massachusetts, one's in California. We've got some in the UK, Seattle, Florida. They're all over the world, actually. Are they they're building different pieces of it, or yeah, right. Huh. That that last one you'll notice the um, orange and blue. That's the Mustang, Cal Hill Mustang. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Wow. And this is one of our disinfection systems that's being developed. And then we have okay. another disinfection system. So this is kind of the the, the concept goal. of what the final yeah the mm -hmm. end goal is. Um, a system that we can drive just about anywhere. The roads are really rough. Mm -hmm, We're you mm -hmm. know, in our target market. And then you take the uh, the pump that's off to the left out into the field. That and little one, like they're a 55 gallon drum kind yeah, of thing? Yeah. So it's actually not a drum. Um, it's, a, it's a pumping system. Wow. You push the material to the truck. Mm -hmm. And then what we're hoping to accomplish in the truck is actually separating out all the debris, all the grit, rocks, glass, metal, sanitize that, leave it on site because we don't want to transport it. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with what we call a refined sludge. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to thicken that sludge and extract as much water as we can from that, clarify, deodorize, this sanitize. Is nope, all right there. In the truck? Right there on the truck, on huh. the little truck. Wow. So, and then we eject um, clarified, safe water that doesn't smell bad and you can actually use it for irrigation. Wow. Um, and dump it right on site and all we do is transport the solids. And that way we can cut the fuel costs and uh, there's a number of other benefits if we're only transporting the solid mm -hmm, waste, mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. not the water. How long would that whole process take? Uh, that happens in real time. So it's, we're processing about 45 gallons a minute. Wow. Um, and a typical pit 
is about a thousand gallons. Mm -hmm. So 20, 30 minutes, we should be done and we can move on to the next pit. That's amazing. Yeah. Holy cow. It's, uh, it's, and so there's no, all... nobody can do this. I mean, there's yeah. The yeah. waste treatment plants don't do this. So it's actually, it's really cool stuff. That is amazing. And it has to be affordable and rugged and it, you know, has to be operated by someone who doesn't have a PhD. Mm -hmm, so, it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it has it's, to be super easy. Yeah. yeah. It's a so what, challenging what, project. Is there any part of it that's being built here in Hawaii? Uh, yeah. There's this part <laughs> is being built here. Ah. Uh, so this is the control system for the entire machine. And this oh, is a, this is a prototype. Oh, very cool. So this is like the brains. Yeah. Huh. So this will control every element of the system. Um, there's little features on it, like it's got a printer, so you can print a receipt. Uh, it has GPS, so we know what pit we're emptying. So is this, so this going to charge the people that you're servicing? Right. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's a... It's so it's like a business. Yep. Yeah. That's all the awesome. emptiers are, well, almost all the emptiers are, are in their, in the business for a profit. That's there's government great. agencies that do mm -hmm. as well. but. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we want to be able to uh, charge them mm -hmm. and charge them if they're throwing extra waste in, like trash, oh. because the trash can damage the equipment and it's just another burden that the mm. operator has to deal with. So, um, so hopefully, it'll train people to kind of separate waste, maybe. Right. Exactly. Right. And and there's a number of reasons. One is it's 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 a challenge to pump the the trash, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when individuals throw trash into the pits, the pits need to be pumped more often. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. So we're trying to reduce the number of times the pits have to be empty. Wow. So we've got GPS, we've got cellular capability, so it can actually communicate where it is, huh. how much it's pumped, how much it's charging. Um, and wow. again, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's preventing uh, fraud, it's mm -hmm, uh, letting mm -hmm. the owner know where his equipment is, how often it's being used, um, helps him with maintenance, things like that. Ah, so this will kind of let you know how the process is going? Yep. Okay. Huh. That is amazing. Sounds like there's a lot of moving pieces, like with the missile Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty complex <laughs> piece of equipment. That is amazing. So, how far along are you? What's the well, next we're three step? years into the project. Um, this is a development kit. The next phase for this part would probably be about a year's effort. Um, mm. The equipment itself, so right now we're focused mainly on the pumping equipment, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is what, the, what you saw on the slides. Um, one of those systems, the one that was in the back of the pickup truck, just completed its field testing, domestic field testing. Uh, one of them's in field testing and one starts field testing in the next couple months. Wow. And this is actually set up a, a bit like a competition. So these three companies are huh. competing with each other to, to move on to the To see who gets into phase. the final. Yeah. Mm. And so whoever is most successful mm -hmm. this phase, the next phase will actually be, will be sending the equipment to Africa and testing there. Wow. Yeah. When, when do you think that's going to be by? That's supposed to happen sometime in October. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing, and there's probably tons more applications. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. specifically yeah, for absolutely. I mean, it's you know the foundation's objective is to improve sanitation in the developing world, but mm -hmm. all the equipment could be used in Hawaii. I mean, it's, there's yeah. there's vacuum trucks in use here. Yeah, North Shores. I mean, this should revolutionize how sanitary sewer yeah. collection systems work. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing, and it's right here in Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. This sure. is great. Um, my guest today has been Andrew Whitesell of Beaumont Design. Check out, where can we find information? Uh, fsmtech.org. FSMtech.org. We'll show the, some of the images that I showed today. Okay. And then beaumontdesign.com is the company's website. Beaumontdesign.com. Great. So check it out if you want more information. This is the latest and greatest in sanitary sewer systems. Yep. Sanitation, very cool. Non sewage systems, actually. Non sewage systems. Yeah. It's on site sanitation. <laughs> on site sanitation. Got it. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much for being with us today and supporting our tech ecosystem. Um, this has been High Growth with HTDC and your host, Cindy Matsuki, on ThinkTech Hawaii. We'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>